Okay, Kathy, I was going to say, and I, I am completely in your hands. Oh, well, that's a dangerous place to be, Mikey. Well, you yeah. So, And I should say, Mikey, we're going to keep this clean tonight because I know for a fact that some of my gorgeous relatives from Newcastle are, are listening. You and I are both from Newcastle, and we know what delicate sensibilities people from Newcastle have, Mikey. We're very familiar with that. Oh, and in, in fact, I was, I was saying in an interview the other day, I, I wrote this book knowing that my auntie Pam would read it or someone would read it to her. And so that, but having said that, we'll probably avoid the Mozart chapter, won't we? Yeah, I think we'll do that. Okay, well, let me kick it off, Mikey. You open the book by talking about what an absolutely appalling era we are living through right now. Yeah. While reminding us that there have always been appalling people in history. Do you have a particularly personal interest in appalling behaviour? Oh, Cathy. <laughs> I have been. I, 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 have, I have been appalling myself in the past. I mean, I've been, and quite often I've, I've done it at events that you've also attended. In fact, it's one of the reasons I like researching this book is because it reminds me that it's almost like watching the, um, the Kardashians. It's like, yeah, as I was researching, I realised I'm awful, but I'm not H.G. Wells awful. <laughs> you know, I've done some troubling things, but I'm not as troubling as Sir Isaac Newton was as a young man and, and as an adult. So um, did you write this book to reassure yourself? Cathy, I do everything to reassure myself. You know, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a deeply shallow man who, who, who lives on praise. Um, it was just a, a, a historic, you know me, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I am a history nerd. And I was just uh, amazed that uh, when it comes to bad behaviour, to quote the late, great David Bowie, we've been crashing in the same car since, uh, since the pharaohs. Mm. And that's one of the things I found fabulous about reading your book. Um, I, you know, I've, I've got to say, Mikey, I'm not saying this just because I'm a mate and uh, a fan, but uh, it, it's a really fabulous book, I've got to say oh. to everyone who's joined us, and thanks for joining us. Um, it's, it's very funny, but it's also amazingly erudite, and I oh. learned a lot of things about history reading it that I didn't. <laughs> no, so, yeah, 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 we, 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 history, uh, well, the way we taught history at school focuses on the big battles and the big inventions and the, um, <clears throat> the lustful, the lustful behaviour uh, tends to get uh, left out, so I went and found it. Yeah, I would have paid more attention in history class if I'd read your book. Also, also actually, Matt O'Kine says on the back, if they taught history like this in school, I wouldn't have failed. I, I find it bizarre that Matt failed anything. Such a clever man. So, Mikey, um, you know I'm a bit of a feminist. Yes. Um, I think you once said to me, you know, that's a great thing. We still own the house. We're letting women pick out the curtains now. Oh, I'm I was just there. trying to get a rise out of you, Catherine. You know that. Um, so, look, as a feminist, I was very taken by your claim that bicycles threatened men in the 19th century. Yeah. And in fact, they threatened them more than the suffragette movement where women were trying to get the vote. Um, how so, and should I get a bicycle? Well, well, I'll leave it up to you. I'm just gonna quote from the book here. In 1896, Munzig's magazine wrote, to mend the bicycle in the beginning was merely a toy. Another machine added to the long list of devices they knew in their work and play. To women, it was a steed upon which they rode into a, a new world. And you would think that would be a good thing, but actually uh, to the Victorians, uh, women riding bikes became incredibly threatening. Um, <laughs> the, riding, the riding was made even more dangerous to the women who also had to dodge abuse, um, sometimes rocks. Oh, excuse me, the cat wants to get out. Um, <laughs> and and the, the other thing too was that they got completely appalled but to ride a bicycle safely, a woman had to wear trousers. And to the point where, and I'm not making this up, some bright spark actually invented a skirt that had a, a list of, that had a bunch of uh, pulleys and hooks inside it that when you cinch the waistband, converted from a skirt to trousers. But to, dis, to, to dissuade women from actually riding a bike, they came up with, and this is, um, this is uh, several positions pump, uh, published the idea of the, they wanted the terrifyingly female-only condition called bicycle faced, <laughs> and uh, this is this is the, uh, the the literary digest of 1895 printed this ridiculous warning: overexertion in the upright position on the wheel and the unconscious effort to maintain one's balance tend to produce a wearied and exhausted bicycle face in women. It continued to say that the female rider would have these symptoms, usually flushed but sometimes pale often with lips more or less drawn and the beginning of dark shadows under the eyes. 
other journals told how female writers would experience facial changes characterized by a hard clenched jaw and a bulging eye. It was just pretty, pretty bizarre. You think oh, a bit of a metaphor going on there? Well, yeah. Well, they they, they also claimed that the uh, the bicycle. They told the stories of an actress who'd lost her ability to project due to the heavy breathing bicycle performed, or famous dancers who could no longer perform, seeing as their calves had become overdeveloped. And there was, a, there was also a, a Dr. Garajou, a, a, a London physician, wrote about the saddle causing a woman oh. to feel an intimate massage, which he concluded <laughs> could lead to her moral downfall. Yeah. So it was, so it was amazing, yes, this whole bunch, the cat can't make up a time, honey, it's gone back out. Um, yeah, so it, it was bizarre, because you know, when I write this book, I, not only do I make fun of, of, of the raunchy, but I also, you know, you know me, I like to make fun of the puritanical. And yes. so, I, so I like to, you know, basically, and so these guys trying to stop, they also talk about cyclomania, a supposed addiction to cycling. In the 1896 guidebook Bicycling for Ladies, there is a warning. Scorching, fast and aerobic riding is a form of bicycle intoxication. <laughs> it can be spotted in a woman who rode fast and compulsively, often seeking out in hills to cause greater stresses on her body. And there was one sure sign if you spotted a family out cycling and the mother of the family was out of her normal place and was riding ahead of the family, mm. and she was possessed by cyclomania. Fantastic. Maybe I won't get a bicycle. Sounds no, dangerous. Well, well, well actually, yeah, I, I do go on to say quite frankly that um, the, the, only, the only dangerous side effect of, of bicycling is men my age and my size wearing lycra shorts. <laughs> I, I concur with that. I mean, I'm going to say Kenyon Park. I'm, I, mean, I mean, my bum in lycra is like two inner tubes having an argument. <laughs> okay. So let me move on a bit because yeah. one of the... Um, the, the sort of sections and chapters that I particularly in, enjoyed was a section on the peccadilloes of royalty. Yes. Now, I was particularly taken with your section, your chapter on foot tickling. Can you, can you explain the practice and why it was not sufficient to turn up to the regent of Russia's house with, to quote you, mm. a quiver of feather, feathers and a handle mix tape? Yes, well, um, in fact, the first recording of tickling a female monarch's foot to get her in the mood for sex comes from ancient Egypt, where Queen Hatshepsut, who ruled from 1748 BC, would have a eunuch rub uh, an ease oil over her foot and tickle her soles with a peacock feather until she was in the mood. But uh, the high point of, of tickling as a, as a sexual uh, exploit uh, came in uh, the Romanovs in, in Russia. Of course, Catherine the Great was a great exponent. But there was also um, um, Anna Leopoldovna, who actually ruled very brief, briefly for a year. She had six professional ticklers in her retinue. And the, the, their job was to tickle her, um, sing bawdy songs, tell erotic si tales, basically try and turn her on to the point where she could bear to have sex with her husband, who she actually found, found him disgustingly ugly. And it was actually a very well-paid position within the court. Um, and it was, uh, the jobs went along two different sorts of lines. Um, there were female ticklers and there were male ticklers. Now for the male tickler, this would make you a very important person in the court. Unfortunately, one of the downsides was you had to become a eunuch. <laughs> so, you know, it's, you know, that's a long time before that H&R departments. <laughs> Or OHNS, I presume. OHNS, yes. Okay, now you just mentioned Catherine the Great, who um, you know I, I'm a particular fan of, and in fact, um, for anyone who hasn't watched it, there's a fabulous um, series on at the moment called The Great, which was written and directed by an Australian. Um, it's a very, very funny series. That's and that's the that's the is that the Helen Helen Mirren one or, or the other one? No, it's an it's another one, and it's 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 very funny because. It's set, of course, in, as a period costume drama, but they speak in common, you know, everyday contemporary vernacular. So that's what makes it really funny, and I recommend it. Oh, but, a, a bit like uh, Sophia Coppola's version of uh, Marie Antoinette. Exactly. Yeah. So I found your, your chapter on Catherine the Great fascinating. I mean, one of the things is that you, um, you debunk this myth about Catherine the Great and the horse that many of us have heard. Yes, um, uh, that, that was a rumour probably made up by her son, as indeed were most of the, of the more egregious rumours about Catherine the Great because, well, quite frankly, um, her son hated her because he was convinced that 
she was behind the coup that killed his father. She probably was, but quite frankly, the world was a better off person without Catherine the Great's husband. I go into the book, he was a dreadful man who spent all his time drunkenly playing with toy soldiers. <laughs> uh, no, honestly. But, um, and, and when you think of that, I mean, yes, she'd married this man who was an idiot. <laughs> she spoke six languages, was an incredibly intelligent woman, carried on an enthusiastic lifetime of, um, as a pen pal to Voltaire. Mm. Um, and yes, she was lusty. She said herself that she needed to have sex six times a day to concentrate. <laughs> uh, she managed to do that and run the largest empire in the world at the time. But, yeah, but the horse rumor is completely true. No, she did not die having sex with a horse. She actually just died of a stroke. Um, right. In fact, on, you know, in the bathroom. She went Elvis style. <laughs> Okay, so look, one of the things that struck me was your obs observation that history is littered with kings, emperors and the like with overactive libidos. Yeah. What set Catherine apart was she was a woman. Do you think badly behaved women are judged more harshly than men in history? It's a, it's, it's, it, I'm not saying it's a thread for the book, but yeah, it, it is. I'll, I'll give you an example of the emancipated duel, which was a duel that uh, occurred between two very high ranking women in, in Viennese society. And it was one of the rare duels that not only were the two women who were dueling women, but their seconds were, were women. And the person overseeing the duel was, was a baroness who also had a medical degree, which led to the, um, the strange quirk in the, uh, in the duel. Because it was decided that they would fight only to, not to the death, but just to whoever drew blood. And the Baroness had a fair idea that the unclean clothes that people would wear in those days had a fair chance of, um, of infection, causing infection. So it was decided that the women would strip to the waist and duel. And it's, that's why it's, it's known as the emancipated duel or the topless duel. Mm. And the moment the story got out, it immediately um, caused a small cottage industry of gentlemen um, recreating it, shall we say. In <laughs> In, in photography and art for their, for their private collections. Um, there's a whole bunch of laws in the, in the book that are particularly, I remember when I talk about the bizarre laws that are still in the books in America, the arcane laws. Oh, yes. A lot of them seem to do of, well, there's one, there's one state, I think it's Massachusetts, where a woman's hair, no, it's no, New Mexico. A woman's hair is actually considered her husband's property. And she has to ask him if she can get a haircut. Um, then also, too, they're, they're very down on, there's a lot of laws about no more than two women sharing a, a dwelling or a house. And it seems to be that they think that that's obviously how a brothel starts. Uh, it's, it's and, don't, and don't get me started on why in Texas you're only allowed six dildos. There, I said it. <laughs> um, and there was also, just while we're on the subject of the arcane American laws, that... Yeah. that section that really cracked me up. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff about what you can't keep in your bathtubs. In your For some reason, the Americans are obsessed about not letting you keep alligators, mules, and wildcats in your bathtubs. Also, too, there's a law that's against it. It's against the law to have sex with a porcupine in, in, in New Mexico, once again, in New Mexico. Um, why that needs to be a law, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's illegal to enter the state of Alabama with a chicken on your head. Fair enough. <laughs> Um, and there's also uh, in Rhode Island, and this, this one just struck me because it's not disgusting, it's just so bizarre. It's illegal to throw pickle juice at a trolley car. Why this had to become a law is beyond my comprehension. Well, I, I definitely recommend the sections on bizarre American laws. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Now, I'm just moving on a bit. Um, there's a general belief. Um, that graffiti started with the invention of the spray can and the texter. No. But for those of us who haven't had the opportunity to visit Pompeii or Herculaneum, can you unpack how far back the practice of writing rude things on the back of toilet doors actually goes? Well, the word graffiti comes from the Italian graffiato, meaning scratched. And when they discovered Pompeii, when, when, when it was re earth, they found a lot of, you know, you know, quite a few erotic uh, murals and all that sort of stuff. Mm. But they also found a lot, and I mean a lot, of graffiti. And the translations I have to this, um, I acknowledge the wonderful Mary Beard, who's probably one of my favourite mm. um, historians. Okay, let me... Uh, well, I'll say here, 
I have left out most of the poo stuff, not because I'm being censorious, but simply because there was just way too much poo stuff, like a worrying amount of poo stuff. <laughs> um, this is from the bottle of Inulus and Papillo. Weep, your, weep you girls, my penis has given you up. It is now only for men's behinds. Goodbye, wondrous femininity. Um, Bar of Ithacus. I had sex with the barmaid. You know, I'm going to bet the guy who wrote that didn't. <laughs> uh, the, in the gladiator bar barracks, uh, Celadus, the Thracian, makes the girls moan. I've got a funny feeling that Celadus wrote that himself. <laughs> um, the streets of Mercury. Uh, Publius Cumiculus Restitutus stood here with his brother. I only include that to illustrate that not all Roman graffiti was filthy. Some of it was actually quite dull. Um, oh, yes, I like this one from the inn. Of the, this is found at, at an inn for mule drivers, known as the inn of the mule drivers. We have pissed in our beds, host. I admit we shouldn't have done this. If you ask why, there was no potty. Oh, and there's one I, I particularly liked about um, a, a sort of the early food review. Oh, yes. Um, let, let me just find that. Uh, that was actually from... Oh, no, that's the that one. Oh, yes. This is, this is from the house of Cuspius Panzer. The finance officer of the Emperor Nero says the food here is poison. And uh, in fact, that was the same in where the, the same guy later peed his bed. Hmm. So it's, it's like the first bad Yelp review. <laughs> yeah, so um, a lot of things we think are modern are actually uh, have their roots in uh, the ancient past. And I mean, it's, uh, so, yes. so before we leave the Romans, and, and yes, I, I, am, I am reading out some of the nicer ones. Mm. Let me just let me just also say, this is this was found on the atrium at the house of Pinaris. If anyone does not believe in Venus, they should gaze at my girlfriend. So oh. they were capable of being touching. That's nice to hear. Yeah, but then but then the one after that is absolutely disgusting. Yes. <laughs> now we're all familiar with the phrase "I died laughing." Ah. But according to your book, some people actually have died laughing. You're a comedian. Are you trying to kill us all? Can you explain? Well, it's, it's funny. Comedians, it, it is such a violent term. If you do a good gig, you killed. You walk, how would you go, mate, mate, I killed. I killed out there. And if you don't do well, you died. You died. And there's another strange one too. Um, it's your, it's, you could... How'd you go? Oh, man, I'm gonna go out there tonight and kick it, kick it in the dick. I don't even know what that means. But, but yeah, th there is a thing. But I think you're referring to um, the ancient uh, Grecian of uh, uh, Chrysippus, who was one of the great uh, thinkers of, of one of the great Stoic thinkers in around 230 BC. And the story goes that he'd been he'd been actually at the at the early Olympic Games. He'd been on the he'd been on the Terps all day. He he wrote over 700 works on philosophy. Uh, you know, very intelligent. None of his works survived, but he's, he's still regarded as a very important man. He was at the 143rd Olympian and he attended a feast where he consumed more than his fair share of wine. Also, too, he had a very, he was known to personal hysterical fits of laughter. While walking home, he saw an old woman feeding figs to a donkey. In his drunken state, he found this hysterically funny. He then drunkenly suggested, now give the donkey pure wine to wash down the figs. And so, Wine, uh, pure wine means wine that wasn't watered down or, or seasoned with herbs. And so uh, the, the donkey uh, drank wine and Christopher absolutely lost it, breaking the fits of hysterical laughter. And we do know we had a rather unusual laugh, particularly when we had a few drinks. Uh, Diogenes La Laertius noted that the philosopher would keep his upper body completely motionless, but enthusiastically wiggle his legs in time with his chortling. But uh, the 73-year-old foamed at the mouth, chortling historically, and Probably died. Mind you, he's not the only person who was who was who has died laughing. King Martin of Aragon, who in 1410 met his maker after his court jester apparently told him a fatal joke that coincided with a bout of indigestion. Um, the Italian poet, satirist, playwright, and inventor of, of modern literate pornography, Pietro Aretino, was said to have suffocated from laughing too much, as did Thomas Urquhart, the Scottish writer and aristocrat who found the news that Charles II had been made king too hilarious to handle. If you wonder when you've heard of the, the name Thomas Urquhart before, it's a character from the original House of Cards. Oh, in, yeah. 
in modern times, there was a laughing death was linked to a man who had a heart attack during the Ecky Thump routine when it was performed by the Goodies. And the movie, and A Fish Called Wanda. And one chap in a, in a New York hospital in the 1990s, he was actually in hospital already, but he didn't make it to the end of a particularly funny episode of Seinfeld. He actually, he actually died watching, I don't know which one it is. Oh, and then the next chapter is Mozart, and we can't read that. No, we can't. Yeah, I, I, look, remember, people from Newcastle are listening. Very yes. delicate sensibilities. Oh, very delicate. Yes, yeah, very delicate, yes. <laughs> okay, now, okay, let's move on a bit. Given the high cost of private health insurance, who amongst yeah. us hasn't thought about getting a bit of an amateur surgery to keep the cost down? Speaking of which, can you tell us a little bit, a bit more about the fascinating John Brinkley and his cure for men with issues in the uh, trouser department? Well, let's let's be honest. If you if you want to rip, you know, there are a lot of scandals in this book, and quite frankly, men with erectile dysfunction have been open slather for tricksters and hucksters in time of memoriam. But by the 1930s, you had a quack and drunkard called John Brinkley living the high life. He owned three yachts, a vast Los Angeles mansion with his name spelt out. This is a doctor in the garden, in neon. He had a huge pool tile. He had a huge pool out the back, tiled with tiny swash tickers. Oh, yes, before I forget, he was also a, a friggin' Nazi and a massive admirer of Hitler. He had, he had a two story pipe organ that he would hire the organs from Bruman's Chinese Theatre to play for at parties. And he was a friend of the Duke of Windsor. Mm. Think of him as a creepy Jay Gatsby. Okay, he was a self taught surgeon. <laughs> now, I'm trying to be as delicate about this as I can. His, um, his cure for erectile dysfunction was to implant goat's testicles into the scrotum of men who are an underperform, underperforming bully. I, I should point out, I'm not saying transplant, I'm saying implant. He would slice them open and just whack the, goat, the goat's testicles in and sew them up. This made him one of the wealthiest people in California. In fact, um, <laughs> this is bizarre enough to mention, there was some of his, because um, he, he, you know, he had franchises, he had hospitals all over, mostly the rural part of America and, and, and the Southwest, where not only could you have the procedure, but before the procedure, you could actually go out the back and choose the goat, a little bit like you would a lobster at a Chinese restaurant. And, um, and then, of course, he would sell them marked up sugar water. And on a serious note, as you might imagine, a lot of people died. And on a serious note, there is a, there is a claim to be made that he was one of the most prolific serial killers of the 20th century. Because, and eventually, he was, thank God, he was brought down by Morris Fishbein, the editor of the American Medical Association, who called him out as being a, as being a fraud and a braggart. And Brinkley did what all fraudsters do. He sued him. Dumb move. Yeah. In fact, uh, well, for that, he, he, he had no degrees. He, within, within two years of, of, of taking the American Medical Association to court, within two years, he was, bank, he was bankrupt, had a heart attack, and for some reason, lost a leg and died soon after. But there is one, there is one good thing that comes out of Dr. Brinkley. Mm -hmm. He was really good at self-promotion. And as such, he would give like huge rants and raves about his procedures on radio. And in between, he would play country music. Now, the thing was, American radio stations at the time were very limited in wattage. They would only reach small parts of the country. So he built his radio station just over on the Mexican border, which meant the wattage was unlimited. So he played a lot of country music. Um, in fact, he's regarded as probably the person who did more to propagate the rise of American country music in the 1920s and 30s and he's, one of his favourites was to play the Carter family. And as the story goes, that as a, there was a young boy, young, young boy in Tennessee who used to listen to the show, who fell in love with June Carter, and that young boy was Johnny Cash. That's amazing. Yeah, it's a nice part of the story. Don't get me wrong, he was an utter, utter bastard. But at least <laughs> there's a nice end of the story. I'm glad to hear that. Okay, now, Mikey, you and I both went to Hamilton South Primary, as it happens. And uh, are you going to tell everyone? Yeah, we were in kindergarten together. I'm not going to tell that story, though. No. 
That's well, I will good. say it. I was the underpants monitor in kindergarten. Yes. And my job was to take certain, usually boys, up to the principal's office to get a, set, a clean set of underpants. And I will not divulge whether Mr. Robbins was one of those boys. <laughs> yes, it's, am it's amazing. Kathy and I hadn't seen each other for, for many, many years. And then, um, then we got out the class photos. She got out, I was like, oh, yes, we're in the same kindergarten. And she, went, I was, she was like, she said, I was in the underpants. And I went, oh, I remember wetting my pants. And she said, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you yeah. go. There you go. I, I, have a, I have a sort of strong memory. Um, <coughs> let's call me an imaginative child or perhaps yeah. just a blatant liar. Oh, uh, right. Of, of trying to make, make up things for show and tell to make my presentations more engaging and gripping. Um, so I think we've all, some of us have made up things for show and tell presentations in infant school, primary school. Uh, but William Henry Ireland went a little further than that. Can you tell us about him? Okay, folks, this is a slightly complicated st story, but bear with me because it, it, it's bizarre. William Henry Ireland, now his father was a bloke called Samuel Ireland. He was a rather wealthy engraver and he had aspirations to be a writer. Now, William Henry had been described by one of his teachers at school as being so stupid as to be a disgrace to the school. And his father constantly berated him. But Samuel had a passion. He had a passion for antiquities and, and particularly anything involved in sh with Shakespeare. So this is 1795. So at, at his father's house, there are a few paintings by Hogarth, some rare antiquated manuscripts and books as well as a rag that he claimed was an actual segment of the mummy's shroud. But Samuel was obsessed with a bard, and Henry would later recall, my father would declare that to possess a single vestige of the poet's handwriting would be esteemed a gem beyond all price. William Henry, the son, got a job in a law firm. Now, the law firm gave him access to a lot of antiquated paper. So he started making little scraps of paper, and he learned to forge Shakespeare's name. So he actually forged it, and not only really, this, he actually he then further aged the paper by holding it over a candle, like we used to do back in high school, you know, when we were doing our assignments. Um, then he attached a, a wax seal, which he and he just grabbed a, a seal from nearby. He didn't know exactly what it was, but um, turned out that his father didn't believe it was Shakespeare, but his father had a friend, um, Sir Fred. What's his name? Sir, Fre Sir Frederick Eden. Now, Sir Fred was a bit of a buff on Shakespeare. And for some reason, the actual logo on the seal he just grabbed at random was a quintain, a piece of medieval training equipment that jesters, jousters would level their lance at for target practice. Now, Sir Fred went, oh, obviously you shake a spear at that. This must be Shakespeare's genuine fine, okay? So you would think that would be enough to make the dad happy, but no. Uh, to oblige his demanding father, and with the resources, of, he, did, he, um, he made up receipts. He went as far as to construct a love poem from Shakespeare to Anne Hathaway, complete with a lock of his own hair. Now, you think he would have stopped at that, but no. William Henry then turned into printed texts of some, some well-known plays and got back to for forging, alerting a passage here or there, just making a few changes. In a short time, in his own Shakespearean handwriting, he gave his father the first draft of Hamlet. You would think he would stop there. <laughs> no, he kept going. And that's where it really gets bad. Because by going through some old myths that Shakespeare used to write himself, or Shakespeare had used as models for his stories, and some bits he stole from history plays, he actually wrote a play called Vertigan and Rowena, the great lost Shakespearean play. You think they would have stopped there, but no. Um, around about this time, Sheridan, Richard Sheridan, had just opened the Drury Lane Theatre and needed a big hit to follow his own play, The School for Scandal. Now, Sheridan was no fan of Shakespeare's. He reckoned that a recently discovered masterpiece might be the thing to put three and a half thousand bums on seats that he desperately needed. He went and read the play and Thought it was bad, but he, he just thought it was just too much good box office. Um, things began to unravel just before Christmas in 1795. Samuel actually, Samuel Allen actually published his collection of forgeries. The London newspapers were not too kind. The Telegraph even went to the point of writing a satirical version. Uh, Edmund Malone, expert and editor of Shakespeare's complete works, took aim describing the published papers as clumsy as a clumsy and daring fraud. 
He took particular interest in a letter supposedly written to Shakespeare from Queen Elizabeth, dismissing the style and spelling as not only not the author orthography of Elizabeth of her times, but it is for the most part not the orthography of no age whatsoever. Unfortunately, this article came out two days before Vertigan and Rowena, Rowena premiered at Drury Lane. Opening night starts off okay, it's a full house. But then in the final act, noted actor in, uh, John Philip Campbell completely overplayed a soliloquy where Vortigan confronts death and the audience started laughing. In fact, the cast started laughing. They completed, they did. And it was announced there would be a repeat performance the following Monday. This was, was a, this greeted, greeted with, with blows. In fact, the, the theatre rioted until Sheridan came on and said, look, I'm going to bring back school for scandal. And it was the, it was the one and only performance, although occasionally academics do like, do like to put on performances. But for William Henry, that was the end of it. And he said that night was the soundest he'd slept in his life because the fraud was over. His, yeah. father, his father basically refused to believe he'd been uh, tricked by his son, who he regarded as an idiot. And he clung to that delusion for the last four years of his life. And, and the two men never reconciled. But just the, while we're on Shakespeare, Mikey, I mean, do you want to just um, briefly tell everyone who's listening because um, I, I didn't know this, I found this fascinating, about the guy who, um, who wrote the happy version of King Lear. Nathan Tate. If you, if you saw King Lear, which I've, you know, I personally regard as the greatest of Shakespeare's plays, if you, if you saw King Lear uh, pretty much any time from the late 1600s, virtually through to the early 19th century, you are watching a, a romantic comedy. A guy <laughs> called Nathan Tate um, took the play, he removed the character of the fool, he has an ending where Lear lives, uh, Cordelia gets married, and they all live happily ever after. And this play was, and it was performed in that form for quite a long time. It was only some of the great um, actors like Garrick and Keane who actually got it back to the original. But even so, in the Americas, it was still performed as a romantic comedy up until the 1870s, where the actor who played the first proper King Lear in the version we know was the brother of John Wilkes Booth, who shot Lincoln. Yeah. Um, just a little bizarre fact. One of those things that you have up your sleeve. Yeah, but the idea that King Lear was a, was a romantic comedy it still amazes me. Yeah, it was fascinating. It's like one of, one of the many fascinating detail, details in the book. Now, look, finally, Mikey, before we might throw to questions soon. Sure. Um, people know you as a comedian from your long stints on radio and, of course, from your smash hit, TV show Good Newsweek, yeah. um, and you have written a number of other books. I mean, Seven Deadly yeah. Sins and One Very Naughty Fruit, I highly recommend, and you have to read the book to work out what the naughty fruit is and why it's naughty. Um, but both, of, uh, both Seven Deadly Sins and Reprehensible show you to be a remarkably erudite man. Oh, thank you. Credi yeah, well, yes, and thank incredibly you. well read. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your interests outside comedy? Because I think it's I mean, I know you because we're mates and I know about your, your, how widely read you are. A lot of people don't know that side to you. So, want... so tell us what, you know, what, what do you read, what are you obsessed with and what drives your kind of fascination with history? Well, at, at the moment, I'm afraid I'm, I, I'm reading um, Trump's niece's book about mm. Trump. And I have to admit that when I was writing this book, it was um, before the pandemic. Uh, but uh, Trump featured so much in the book, my ed editor said, you're gonna have to pull back on the Trump <laughs> jokes. And I said, okay, I, I said, give me one in the forward. So I say in the forward that if you, um, if you have delicate sensibilities, I suggest that you treat this book as you would a spa bath in a hotel you haven't stayed at before. You know, just dip in and out before you plunge in. But if you've got a tougher stomach, you can use this book as a drinking game. Every time you come across some piece of behaviour that reminds you of a current world leader, maybe some orange-tinted buffoon, um, have a shot of your favourite tipple. Just don't say, I didn't warn you. And uh, uh, there is one other Trump joke, which I'll, I'll share with you because I couldn't help myself. There's a story about Andrew Jackson's parrot and how it got thrown out of a funeral for swearing. But I point out that the, there's been a long tradition of, of, uh, of, of American presidents having parrots. Um, in fact, and having pets and having dogs. In fact, the Trump administration is one of the only um, presidencies that, that doesn't have a pet. 
uh, unless you count Jared. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, okay, so Emma Kate, how are we going with questions? Are, we've got a few questions there. We've got one that's come through so far. Um, so yeah, I'll remind everybody, if you do have questions for Mikey, as Catherine says, send them through to me now. Um, Denver says, um, this is super entertaining. Where do you even start um, researching and verifying these types of historical stories? Ah, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. You start with books. I always find books are a very good place to start. And then you go online. Now, when I say you go online, you don't just trawl the internet. I tend to find if something's been, something is, is an academic paper, has been written by, you know, and, and there are a lot, of, a lot of academics who write in the area of social history these days, then you, you, you can work with that. Or something that's appeared in, when I say a newspaper, if it's appeared in the Guardian, the Times, then, you know, then, I, then, then I'll, I'll take that as a source. Um, but then it does come down to, if you get something off the net, you've got to fact check it at least three times. It's, you know, it's, I mean, yeah. I'm not, well, it's a history book, but I'm not an historian, but also too, I don't want to get the stuff wrong. You know, I don't want what I'm saying to be lost by going, oh, hang on, you got the date wrong there, or you got this wrong there. You know, for it to work as an entertaining story, you've got to get the, you've got to get the bones right before you hang the meat off it. So yeah, it was, it was four months of research before I actually started typing a word. Yeah, and Mikey, I mean, you're, you're kind of very careful, I think, throughout the book, even though, as you say, you're not a historian. I mean, I was pretty impressed by the fact that you, um, you're you very clear that, um, you know, where something's a disputed fact, mm. you know, you point that out. And, I mean, we know that history is <coughs> told from many perspectives and, you know, anyone who's a historian is going, is going to tell you that. Um, there's no definitive account often. Well, the, the best example I, I can give for that is actually the life of H.G. Wells, who um, was, you know, a, a phenomenal writer, wrote all those amazing books within a four-year period. Mm. But also, too, was, and he was not an attractive man. He was short, he was plump, he was bald, he had a high-pitched voice. But he, he had a lot of sex. He got laid a lot. And he was a bit George Michael. He liked to do it outdoors. <laughs> and he liked the idea of it. In fact, he once bragged that he and a lover broke, her, broke two separate hotel bedrooms in one weekend. And that's all documented. That's not, but there is one story, and I, got, I, I, I read it somewhere, but I don't, checked it again. And no one can verify this. And I say that at the start. I say, look, this story may be apocryphal, but I include it because I just love it so much. Yeah. One day, Wells and his lover, who I think was actually a, a female Australian poet who was living in London at the time, decided they'd try something new, um, sex-wise. So Wells went into his office, came back with a cardboard box that was full of all the bad reviews his books had ever received. He tossed the bad reviews down on the ground and they made wild, passionate love on top of them before throwing <laughs> them in the fireplace. As I said, I don't know whether it's true or not. And I say in the book, I just have to include it because it's such a good story. I think that's fantastic. And as an author who's had my share of horrific reviews, I don't know if I'll take that that kind of course of action. But I mean, I have been told, you know what, if you get a bad review, just get the ruler out and measure the column inches. Yes, yes. Well, that's the alternative approach to it. And I think HG would have done that himself. <laughs> We've had another couple of questions come in. But um, Andrew asks, um, what was the most bizarre fact that you found during your research? Wow, that's a huge one. There are, um, first off, the, the, the old joke about, uh, if you believe that, uh, I've got a bridge to sell you, is true. That people used to sell shares in the Brooklyn Bridge to uh, unsuspecting tourists. The fact that C.S. Lewis, who uh, I, um, you know, the Narnia books I, I loved as a kid, was once thrown out of a party at university for um, offering other students if, uh, five shillings if they would go into the spare room with him so he could give them a spank. And they actually found some poetry and some letters he wrote over the years that, um, let's just, I'll just leave it at this. You can read about the book, but you know, 50 Shades of Narnia. Um, <laughs> which is sort of weird because not only is he a bit, is he a bit of a, you know, actually he was a pervert, but also, too, at the same time, the books are all Christian allegorical tales. 
Mm. And there are actually um, evangelical Christians in America, bizarrely enough, who um, have almost formed a cult based around C.S. Lewis. I don't know if they know about his spanky behavior, but there you go. There's actually one church that has a um, oh, stained glass window of C.S. Lewis. <laughs> Um, Heather asks, what gave you the idea to write this book? Oh, because um, it, it, the idea of it amused me. Now, I think that's the only way that you can sort of go about something like this is it's like, do I, think, do I think it's a good idea? And then, then I was struggling. I mean, I, I, also too, I had a few stories that I, I'd, collate, I'd sort of come across when I was researching my first book that didn't suit that. And then, you know, as Catherine told you, I do find appalling behavior quite entertaining and interesting. And I do like that history, Ben. Then I didn't have a title. And sometimes a title can really help, you know, coalesce in your mind how the book's going to be. Mm. And um, the title came to me um, while my dentist was performing root canal surgery on me. And I was uh, on the nitrous. I was, I was lying back there while I was dr drilling away at my tooth. And I said, ah, ah, put, he said, what? I said, can I, have a pen, can I have a pen and paper? And he went, what? I said, reprehensible. Remind me when we're done. <laughs> that is actually how I came up with the title. So you're saying the book's drug-induced, Mikey? No. No, you know me, you know me Catherine. I, 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 well, I can write, I can write with a hangover. But I, I, I can't write with even a glass of wine in me. My, my spelling's bad enough as it is. You know that. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, David has asked, who was the most appalling monarch as identified in your research? Wow, that's a good one. Um, you know what? Um, hang on, let me find, let me see if I can find the chapter. Well, actually Henry VIII, well, the one thing about Henry VIII that I hadn't realized before is apart from, you know, the gluttony and the dreadful treating of, of, of wives and, and, you know, destruction of the church, um, was also an absolute mug punter, a dreadful gambler. He actually lost to the bells that were in the original cathedral where St. Paul stood over one throw of the dice. And as such, he, um, he banned gambling, but he didn't, well, he tried to, but he never stuck to the rules. Um, the most appalling, uh, there's a couple of, uh, Pharaoh Pepe II, who was the last king of the, uh, last Pharaoh of the old kingdom, who were, apart from marrying, well, quite a few of his half-sisters, and maybe one of his full sisters, they're not quite sure about that. Also collected pygmies, which is appalling. Uh, but he liked to go on picnics. And if Pepe went on a picnic, try saying that quickly, if Pepe went on a picnic, he would um, get slaves to uh, strip down naked. He would cover them in honey and they'd walk around as human fly strips <laughs> to keep flies off his food. I will say though, if you are researching that, do not Google the words naked slaves covered in honey because you will not be taken to where you think you're going to go. <laughs> that, that sounds like a really good use for my children, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, 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 look, I keep saying Mozart. Mozart was amazing, amazing genius. But I really cannot, without knowing you people personally. Don't go there. You just have to read the Mozart chapter, okay? It's just read them. <clears throat> just on, that, on that, that question, which is a really good question, um, wasn't there some, was a king, right, I think, who used to, like, um, ride his horse and, and didn't bathe? Oh, and... James I. James I. Yeah. James I was probably <laughs> the stinkiest monarch in history. <laughs> he was so obsessed with hunting that he wouldn't get off his horse to go to the bathroom, and that's... I'm talking both functions. Um, he would wear the same hat consistently. When, it, when, it, when the animal was brought down, he would stick his hands into the guts and rub it all over his clothes. And his... But he did say, and this is true, he was a regular bather. He took one every year, whether he needed it or not. <laughs> James I was appalling. Um, there's a guy called Arthur Comstock. And when I say I like to attack, oh, yeah. I like to attack the Puritans. Comstock was a dreadful Puritan. Um, he became postmaster general, and it's more like this. He made it his lifelong ambition, apart from trying to get plays banned on on, on Broadway that he thought were were rude. Um, it was his lifelong ambition to uh, confiscate marital aids, 
um, to the point where, because there weren't sex shops in those days, so if you know, if women wanted to buy a marital aid or if a gentleman wanted to use one, they had to go through the post. So they had to get past him. He confiscated so many, they could only be measured in tons. <laughs> which is a terrifying thought. Um, so, and, and the other fact too, is, here's a, here's a small one. Ulysses S. Grant, the great um, Civil War general, for a start, couldn't stand his meat not being cooked, completely well done. He was terrified of the sight of blood. The man who oversaw some of the bloodiest battles in history. He wouldn't eat chicken because it walked around on two legs. And he was a gymnophobe, which if those of you who ever watched the sitcom Arrested Development means he was a never nude. He actually bragged that neither his wife, his doctor, his nurses, or any of his other soldiers had seen him naked. Yet he still had four children. <laughs> Other questions, Emma Kate? We've got one last one. Yes, it's from Peter. And Peter says, um, I assume you could not, oh, we've got another one coming now. Uh, I assume you could not have written this, um, researched this before the internet. How limited was our knowledge before the internet? Well, let's face it, this, you know, the history of this book goes back 3,000 years. So everything here has been recorded. It has been recorded. It's just um, we tend to. What, what becomes the textbooks we study and not just, you know, so yeah, everything here is based on fact, but just access to it. And this, yeah, I didn't have to have a primary source. No, I didn't have to, I didn't actually have to pour over ancient, um, like the, to, to find out that um, William the Conqueror once got so fat that his horse used to hide from him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, yeah, true fact. And, but, but he cured it with, with, with a special diet he came up with himself, which was eating no solid food and lying in bed, which basically meant that he, um, he got drunk and slept. And he, he, did lose en he did lose enough weight to get back on the horse. But then another horse threw him in a battle and he got internal bleeding on the pummel. And um, uh, I'll try to do this as polite as possible. It took a few weeks to bury him. So when they actually tried to shove him in, into the sarcophagus, he exploded. That's, you don't see that bit in the Bayou Tapestry, do you? I hope no one's eating dinner, Mikey. <coughs> I've, I've got just got a copper waiting for me. <laughs> What's the other question, Emma Kate? The other question is from the Laugh Resort Comedy Club. Um, and they say, can you please turn Reprehensible into a parlor game for TV with McDermott or animated series? Love your individual works. Um, you are so good together. Will the world ever be treated to another collaboration? Me and Monkey Boy, um, <laughs> I'd I'd lo I'd love to I'd love to do another show with Paul. We were, we were we were on the phone the other day and we were talking about something. There might be there might be something in this 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 this, this book, but who knows? I mean, look, quite frankly, at the moment, everything's up in the air. Everything's up in the air. I mean, I am. Um, you know, it's sort of odd. I was I was saying the other day that you know, normally if I, a book like this, I'd be travelling. You know, and touring around, and I, I would be in your bookstore right now, probably sipping wine with some some Brisbane people and, and signing books. And this is the first time I've ever done a book tour and not gotten out of my track pants. <laughs> not, I mean, I'm wearing a shirt. <laughs> we don't know what you're wearing on the bottom, and we don't want to know, Mikey. Just just my old tracky dacks. You know, this is this, this is the thing I found with, with COVID world that um, I can only tell tell the days these days because if my Track pants standing up on their own. It's probably Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. So that's the last of the questions. So I might hand back to you both for any final comments or questions that you have before we um, unmute everybody and, and let them say thank you to the discussion. Um, I just thought, can I just say something really personal, Kathy? Yeah, sure. You, yeah, we, have. we have known each other for, for, for a very long time. And you, you did, Catherine held my hand during the writing of the first book. But this one, I, I was a big boy, did it on my own. And um, just, just, the, just the response, I just want to say personally, you know, the, the fact that you like it means a hell of a lot to me. Oh. And, and, and I, I, I thank you for your kindness. Oh, Mikey, back at you. Look, I've really enjoyed this, Mikey, as I always enjoy talking to you. And, um, and I want to thank everyone who joined us, and I hope yes. everyone enjoyed it. I really do encourage you to buy the book, because I've, I've, oh, I read it. It's a puppy dog. A puppy dog. No yeah, puppy dog. <laughs> I um I, I genuinely mean it when I said I was I enjoyed it. I laughed out loud a hell of a lot. In fact, I was lying in bed next to my partner and um, waking him up. 
because I was reading late into the night, I couldn't put it down. So it's that kind of book. And, um, you know, everyone stay safe in these crazy times. Please do stay Thanks safe. Thanks for joining us. Another puppy dog. Yay. <laughs> thank I, you all so much. I thank um, you all, thank you all for popping by. It was it was it was lovely. And a shout out to the rallies in Newcastle. Yep. Hi guys. <laughs> thank oh, you. So, oh, this, <laughs> I'm gonna take everybody off mute now. Um thanks so that you can join me in thanking Mikey and Catherine. So everybody's off mute now. Thank you all so Bye. much. Bye. Right. Thank you, Mikey and Kathy. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Andrew. And th thank you, Alicia. I like your glasses. <laughs> no, I haven't had the operation yet, Michael, but I'll you come look, back look, to that. Look well. Look, thanks, <laughs> thanks, everyone, for, for coming along. This was actually a lot of fun. Cheers. It was yeah. good. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a lovely evening. Cheers. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.